So we're in the Titanic bit now. Shipbuilder Supreme, Belfast in 1900 was one of the most prosperous industrial cities in the, in the world. It had the design skills and top quality workmanship to produce world-class steamships despite having to import almost all of the raw materials. Success of Belfast shipbuilding was due to the energy and innovation of its people. Look at him! <laughs> Titanic stories. So we, we are here, so designing Titanic. It's going to be dark in here by the looks of it. But, uh, Robert Hicks and owned a successful ironworks in Eliza Street, Belfast, producing more than the local market could absorb. He decided to expand his business into shipbuilding. As he knew nothing about the industry, he recruited a young shipbuilder named Edward Harland in 1850. Yeah, Harland shipyard. Harland Wolf, it? yeah. yeah. Bowler hats. Flat cap or duncher was worn by most of the workers at the Harlan shipyard when Titanic and her sister ships were built. Practical flat cap was an essential part of the dress, prominent in photographs of all employees from the time. Olympic class plans touched to explore. Wow. Grief. <laughs> The plan of the deck. Yeah. Oh, just tap one of those. I think that's oh. pooper deck. <laughs> Good grief. These are all the drawings then, presumably. The rigging. That's that's what it started with, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, those rivets. Like rivets, yeah. Expansion joints. Oh, good grief. Bulkheads. <sighs> wow. <laughs> you can touch mm. and drag over the. Or you can expand it. Uh, oh, you like this, it. yeah. I just leave me with this. I'm yeah. <laughs> here for hours. <laughs> wow. Mind you, they didn't have a display like that when they built the Titanic, did they? No, they'd have had all these great big bits of paper. Yeah. Building ships on the scale of Olympic, Titanic and Britannic presented huge challenges to Highlander Wharf. New ships required facilities to cater for their size and they constructed the Thompson Graving Dock, the largest in the world at the time. New slipways and enormous new gantry were built to allow for the construction of the ship. The floating crane was imported from Germany, was the largest of its kind in the world. Yeah. Built in Duisburg, Germany. Biggest floating crane afloat. This is Teutonic, so. It's dark in here, isn't it? Yeah, I'm gonna struggle a little bit with the stabilization on the camera. But, uh, so far. So I should have brought the Sony. It'd do better in low light, White Star line. This is Oceanic. So some of the things from the White Star Oceanic dishes and the bell and we're getting really dark around here. You can't. Really see this? Can't see that at all. So look around here. Olympic was the first of three sister ships launched in an elaborate ceremony in October 1910. Olympic had a full life long and successful like, unlike her sister ships, Titanic and Britannic. Served for 24 years, earning the nickname Old Reliable. She <laughs> had a difficult start when she had a collision with HMS Hawk in the Solent off the Isle of Wight. But uh, she carried tons of thousands of passengers and troops 
and after the First World War she was converted to burn oil instead of coal. Titanic. Sail from Belfast to Southampton to begin her maiden voyage, 2nd of April 1912. First sequence is Titanic in Belfast, it's entering the Thompson Dock. Pulling on the ropes here. Huh. Amazing footage. Mm -hmm. Wow. So Titanic left Queenstown on the 11th of April 1912 and headed west across the Atlantic. 14th of April, 11.40 p.m., 400 miles southeast of Newfoundland, it struck an iceberg. These are some of the items salvaged from the wreck site of the Titanic. And pictures. Oh, pictures, yeah. Hmm. Oh, great. Belfast people were shocked and deeply saddened to hear about the loss of the Titanic. Mourned the loss of life and the ship itself. Pride in Titanic was replaced with disbelief it has uh, such a magnificent vessel could vanish so quickly. A decorated cello paints tribute to the cellists on Titanic. Reverses inscribed with their names and addresses, records that they were employed by C.W. and F.N. Black of Liverpool. First to the memorial concert in London on the 12th, uh, 24th of May 1912. All eight of the musicians or Titanic died in the disaster. They were reported to have played Nearer My God to Thee as the ship sank. <laughs> Various things. Memorials about it. Many tributes. Huh. Well. This uh, model in the middle, obviously, as it sinking, has got various corners. Like here, we've got third class saved and lost. Third class lost. Yeah. Second class is about 50 50, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rather more first, first class, class saved. Law, yeah. yeah. And this is the crew, the last one. The crew saved, and crew, crew lost. lost. All those. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I don't think. I was completely engaged in watching the whole proceedings. I didn't have very much time to think of it. I was admiring the judgment he was using. All of them fearful of this. Some of the uh, people's memories, isn't it? Yes, Edith Russell. Can't really hear it that well. No. Can't stop the uh, Marconi <laughs> operator either. <laughs> the video's still playing. Yeah. Oh, the White Star used the most up-to-date communication equipment on board Olympus, Olympic and Titanic. And following the collision, wireless was vital in summoning help. 
the first used on a transatlantic liner in 1904, the Marconi system had a daytime range of up to 400 miles. On Titanic, there were two Marconi operators using the old distress code CQD and the newer SOS alerted other ships to the plight of the Titanic. The exhausted Phillips did not succeed, but Howard, Howard Bride was rescued. Rocket signals, Morse lamps and submarine signalling were also used to call for help from other ships. these ramps and <laughs> I suppose it gives you a chance to have a look in there yeah, yeah we well can look at it from the top the side and yeah it's a big tram <laughs> <laughs> this display here looks like it's going to be a punch up in a minute yeah I think they do like a little shop display around the back that's good isn't it yeah a little street yeah a little street Jewel and pawnbroker. Hat shop. The Daimler Fleet Line bus, 1973 city bus in Belfast. Batch of 70 Daimler double decker buses supplied in 1973 with 77 seat bodies built by Alexander's of Belfast. Can you go on? Don't think so. No. Massive uh, engine at the back, obviously. Can go on that one, but yeah. some at the moment. What we've got here is a showman's living van. It's belonged to Barry Funfair family, who toured Ireland in the first half of the 20th century. It owned extensive fixed rides at Port Rush in County Antrim and Bangor in County Down, where the vehicle was based. Wow. Some caravan, that is not mm, It's quite a climb up. Well, I think you might have steps there, Jen. Do you think? Be, be my guess. Yeah. Look, look at the painting on it. This display is called The Last Bus. <laughs> Characters at the back. We can't, we're not supposed to be on it. Got here, enjoy looking oh, it at. says all aboard, take care. And it says... Enjoy looking, not climbing. Enjoy looking, not climbing. So you could stand on the platform. Right. <laughs> <laughs> really want to do that. It's huge though, isn't it? Yeah. Six-wheeler. Huh. Yeah, we go. Just chatting to uh, the uh, guy who used to... Uh, his family used to build these. That's quite interesting. Hmm. Didn't realise it was a trolley bus. No, no, of course you can't see the... Can't these see are, the... A lot of these are trolley buses, aren't they? Yeah. And it's certainly a different uh, transport museum with the, the trams and the trolley buses and so on. Yeah, it's not all cars or all no. trains. No, no. Nice mixture. To go through there in a minute, that was yeah. really interesting. Not finished in here yet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> They're all tro trolley buses apart from the ones pulled by horses. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Look at this, all the cases and everything on it, pulled by a poor old horse. Ah, here we go. Look, Land, Ro Land Rover fire pump, adapted for use as fire appliances, four wheel drive, particularly suitable for difficult terrain and industrial sites. Built for the Fire Authority in 1976, withdrawn for service and donated to the museum 19 years later. It covered 9,065 miles. Uh, it was equipped to carry 455 litres of water and 229 metres of hose. So, see the farm and rescuing a cat. Oh yeah, I don't know if you can see that on the GoPro, but there's a cat being rescued up there. <laughs> and Daimler ambulance.
trailer pump. Merriweather Hatfield uh, pump. Oh. Uh, whip it, on that one. Yeah, whip it motorized fire pump and a hand operated fire pump here. So this is a whip it. Huh. Have been there, there, we? Yeah, that's yeah. good. All right, that. This next room looks really interesting. Ice cream. Yeah, 1889. All straw and ice cream van. Wow. Delicious ice cream. You got Baker's yeah. delivery van. 1948, that one. That's actually, uh, oh, there's a co-op bicycle at the back there. I was, I was reading that and it said co-op, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> co-op milk float. And Belfast Telegraph van. Delivering the papers. Oh wow, look no. at this beast. It's a removal van. Yeah, John Morgan and Sons removal lorry. Yeah. <laughs> Electric Royal Mail van from 1994. Electric Ford Eco style was used by the Royal Mail to enable Ford to test the effectors of electric vehicles for working purposes. About 100 were made and they were tested throughout North Europe. Top speed of 70 miles an hour and charge would last for 100 miles. Drivers would connect to the specially developed battery to a normal domestic supply and wait between five and seven hours for it to charge. Oh dear. Not much change then. No. <laughs> AA, AA bike. box, yeah. Yeah, and the AA box behind it. Do see one or two about still, don't we? Yeah, I've seen some in Scotland. Yeah. Look at the carriage at the back, where that's from. Giants Causeway, Port Rush, Bush, Valley, Railway and Tramway. Okay. <laughs> this is a Minerva taxi. Uh, from 1911. Would have been chauffeur driven for wealthy owners but it was used as a taxi in the 1930s. It's powered by a sleeve valve engine which would create a lot of smoke when in use. Made by a Belgian company, supplied by the Belfast company of J.B. Ferguson. And here's the Portrush tram. Tram number two. Eighteen eighty-three. Mm. It was the first tram system in the world to be powered by hydroelectricity. Water turbines had been used to generate electricity. Transported tourists and visitors to the Giants Causeway, and been a popular attraction since the seventeen hundreds. That's right. When that uh, when we painted it for the first time. Yeah. An open carriage at the back. Hmm. What's that? Well, this is interesting as well. This is the Victoria Jubilee Bridge plaque. And it says in 1887, the Giants Causeway Tramway contracted the Glasgow firm of P&W McLean to build an iron trellis bridge across the River Bush at Bush Mills. The bridge was named in honour of the Queen's Golden Jubilee. Oh. Yeah. So we're probably going to come across that bridge. Yeah. Down we go. So it makes it accessible, doesn't it, these uh, yeah, walkways? Yeah, that's an idea give, of it. And that yeah. gives you a chance to have a look. 
at the exhibits whilst you're going down. Right, huh. will we see any of our old cars? Well, I can see one car that's... <laughs> it's featured. a truck, isn't it? <laughs> if anyone watches the Hubnut channel, will recognise that car at the end. It's not, it's not his car, but... No. <laughs> There's an Inver car there. An AC Invalid car, to give it its full title. And next to a Vandom Pla Princess 13, 1300. Oh, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Probably the most famous car of all time, really. A Ford Model T. This is a 2011. The Ford Empire was built on this car. 15 million were made between 1908 and 1927. It was an assembly line system that reduced costs and made it the first affordable motor car. N nicknamed Tin Lizzy. Gave ordinary people the chance of owning a car, light but rugged, with a high ground clearance, made it ideal for dirt roads in America. These do not touch. <laughs> Don't know what that is. No. <laughs> this is the Noble 200. Short Brothers and Harland of New Tannards. Built under license from Electra machine named Bau Fulda of Germany. It's by the name Bubble Car. It was built in New Tenements. Idea of a basic economic three wheel car with two seats and a small engine caught on. Particularly people who like the cockpit cabin. Original official name was Fuldermobile after a town where they were built, originally built, never mass produced but built in many parts of the world between 1950 and 69. There we are, it's the original three-wheeler, isn't it? You stand by it so we can get an idea of size. God, it is small, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and it inspired the Mini. Go on, you can read that. And he was one of the most influential cars ever made. Two models were launched in 1959. The name which became part of the English language was almost an afterthought. Mm. So it was originally sold as an Austin 7. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And Morris Mini Miners. Yep. It had three owners, this one. Ailey McCowan owned it last. She liked it so much she wrote an ode to a Mini and spent £700 on repairs after it was involved in a crash. It only done 28,000 miles when it retired to the museum. From 1972, it says iconic, a classic. The VW Beetle launched in 1933 and with 21,529,464 having been built in the world by 2003. Still the best-selling car design in the history of motoring. The Austin 7 was launched in 1922 and was an immediate success. By 1929, annual production had risen to almost 27,000, a figure exceeded only in 1935. Wow. It's cost £140 in 1929 and the colour scheme of, of black and maroon was standard. Could have any, any colour? Yeah, any colour but that. <laughs> Top of the garage here. <laughs> I smell the oil, can't you? Yeah. And the dust. Yeah. <laughs> Bits everywhere. Oh, Hillman Imp. This was a famous car for, for Linwood in Glasgow, wasn't it, really, for Scotland? Yeah, it was. It was the Roots Group response to the Mini, wasn't it? Yeah. Designed in 1963. Yeah, it was less successful, though, than the Mini. Yeah. It was rear-engined. Dad nearly, nearly famously nearly bought me a, a, a Hillman Imp. 
ended up with a mini though, didn't yeah, they, funny mini, enough? Um, van thing, wasn't it, Mini Clubman? Yeah, well, no, it was a mini van that had been converted van. and had windows put in it. This is cute, isn't it? <laughs> What's this, this? Peugeot Bibby. It's a super mini, kind of super mini of its time, designed by Peugeot in 1904. Cheap, tiny and practical. Obviously quite advanced because it had a small but powerful engine at a top speed of 60 kilometres an hour. A successful racer and hill climber. Yeah. yeah. So you've got all the weight over the back wheels, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> but that was fun. <laughs> Because this, Dad had. Yeah, this is an SD1. SD yeah. Yeah, and he had a company car, didn't he? Yeah, I don't think he made it. Was it an automatic? It was an automatic, wasn't it? Or was it? I can't remember now. I don't think it was. No. I just remember it getting stuck in the snow. <laughs> she got stuck on the drive. drive yeah. and uh, couldn't, over the other side of the road and couldn't move. <laughs> This wasn't a three and a half, was it? It was no. a two something. It was two, like a two six, yeah. Yeah, this is, probably a bit underpowered. I don't think it was really. It didn't, wasn't that much difference in power. This is a Van den Plaar. But, uh, but yeah, if you really wanted the, the Bosch one, you'd have gone for the V8, wouldn't you? There's some engines here. K16. K16 or is that the K16? No, that's the Maxi. F ah, right, okay. This is an engine I should be familiar with. The Maxi 1500 engine. Dad actually had an 1800 Maxi Mark II. That was a fabulous car. I thought it was really like that. It was the second car I ever drove. The first car was a Toledo, would you believe? That was the driving instructor's car. Did he have a Toledo as well? Yeah. 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 I think everyone did it. Oh yeah, That's incredibly right. popular. The Rolls-Royce FB60 power unit. Yeah. Triumph Grand Stag. Stag. Yeah. yeah. Grand touring car. And a horrible shade of purple. <laughs> two plus two sold it between 1970 and 78. Designed by Giovanni Michiotti. And this one uh, belonged to the brother of uh, film producer William McQuilty, who produced Titanic, A Night to Remember. <laughs> it's fitted with a hard top that you could remove. Okay, Mercedes SL, 230 SL. Got some fabulous cars in here. Aim was to produce a very fast and a very safe and fast car with high performance, which, despite its sports characteristics, provides a high degree of travelling comfort. And that was the Mercedes chief engineer, Professor Fritz Nallinger. Something we're a bit more familiar with. MG. The MG Roadster. It's one of the great motoring icons of the swinging 60s. Made by Morris Garages of Oxford in 1924. As Type 3 MGB Roadster seen here was a 1972 update. Particular car dates from the 75 and the last year of the original MGB two-seaters. Sold in large numbers in the UK and United States, near 400,000 were made. But in the end it was a US market where new safety reg regulations contributed to its demise. An MG name, incidentally, Morris Garages, was invented in 1924 to distance the sports cars from the sedate Morris Oxford range. There's always one of these, isn't there? There's always <laughs> an Amphicar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just love them. Every decade, someone has a great idea. Yeah. What the world needs is an amphibious car. Yes. <laughs> this is the 60s version of it. Designed by Hans Trippel, who worked for, uh, for the military in Germany. And it was built between 67 and, uh, 61 and 67 
2,800 were made. Unfortunately for the Amphicar, American safety regulations were tightened up in 1967. Either the car's design had to be changed radically or it no, could no longer be afforded sale in the USA. Yeah, because there's one in the Lakeland Museum as well, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a slightly smaller one, actually. <laughs> they beat waves, tides and subs. It says on the newspaper article at the back there. And then we're into Cortina land. The 60s Cortina culture. And this exhibit will mean more to most of the people who remember the 60s. It demonstrates the power of objects to evoke the past. Okay, so what have we got here then? We've got the, uh, the table. We've got the, do you remember the fire there? The electric fire at the back there? Right, Something we, similar, we had one, yeah. Very similar to that. Yeah, yeah. Certainly remember the telly. We never had a lava lamp. Do you see the lava no, lamp no, on there? No, no, we didn't have one. But we did have a radiogram. Yeah. We had a Ferguson radiogram. Yeah. And the thing at the back. That never actually had a Cortina. No, your friends did. did. Your friends well, did, though. Yeah, he yeah. had a later one, though. Yeah. Uh, Alison's dad had a Cortina. Yeah. And the Pouffet. Yeah. He always had one of those. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Oh, and everyone had this picture on the wall, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, that picture. Oh, look at this. That's brilliant. Got the stones in there and Patsy Klein, Engelbert Humperdinck. And until you built up a collection, you were playing the same record, weren't you, over and over? <laughs> Oh. And the Invercar. Yeah. Motor enthusiast. Now AC is the maker of high performance cars, but uh, this car gave disabled people the freedom of the road. It was probably more important. Invalid carriages, really just motorised wheelchairs, have been about since the 20s, but with the help of the National Health Service, specially designed vehicles were provided for the first time. Uh, AC cars and Invercar were the two main manufacturers of these subsidised vehicles. Some 70 options in steering and controls made it possible to adapt cars to individual needs. So this 1980 AC three-wheeler has a glass fibre body, sliding doors, heater, seat belts and fire extinguisher. Unfortunately, invalid cars of this type have become unsuitable for modern roads and were not even allowed on motorways. They sometimes blew over or caught fire. Oh no, yeah. <laughs> the reason for the fitted fire extinguisher, and they were underpowered and slow. Yeah, and that's got the handlebar controls. Oh, my friend had one of these. What, Vanden Plaa? Vanden Plaa, yeah. He just had a box standard uh, Austin 1100. Yeah, come that side. Yeah, so. Do you want to read that? Morris 1100 was launched at the 1962 London Motor Show. Used the same sideways engine layout that had been invented for the Mini, but in a larger car. The Vanden Plaa Princess was the luxury version. So we just had the basic one. Yeah, it's got the, like, the posh leather seats inside. Yeah. Sunroof. And it's got the trims, hasn't it, on the door. Well, and all, all the chrome work at the front. Yeah. Yeah. Lanchester has been the first car to be wholly designed and built in Britain. Lanchester Motor Company was bought out by BSA in 1930. The 14610 uh, seen here was given the old name. Daimler's idea was to appeal to customers who might put tradition and quality above technology or price. <laughs> 1946 Lanchester 10 was craftsman built, beautifully smooth running and very expensive. And even in the 1950s it had a reputation as a car for old ladies. And a starter handle. And a starter handle, yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember that on our very first car. Yeah. Think about road safety here. <laughs> oh. And this is a car, this is what, well, is, is this, a, it's an Anglia, this one, isn't it? Yeah. The Anglia Deluxe. My dad had a popular, which I think was... Same, oh, same version, yeah. I mean, what was noticeable about this was the back sloping window. It actually sloped backwards, so it's quite, it's quite a different design. Mm. Yeah, I used to go to school in one. It's a two-tone blue thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's a climb in the back. 
Yeah. Want to read it? The 1959 Ford Anglia shows how American styling came to British cars. The tail fins and the big grills of US cars in the 1950s movies looked so stylish that there was a ready market. Yeah. Well, it still is quite a stylish car, isn't it? Mm. Great big steering wheel in a bit of a dish. <laughs> Not a huge amount of room in the back. But no, there wasn't. There was only a little yeah. there. We've still got push-out windows like that on our VW up. up. Yeah. Oh, I remember the grab the handles to get out. Yeah. What are the doors? The doors. On oh, the yeah. Pillars, yeah. There. That's right. Grab handles. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember the, you know, the speed thing at the front. The side, yeah. side windows. Yeah. Yeah, quite good because you get a bit of fresh air without getting a Gosh. gale. It's about 100 years ago, that. Almost. <laughs> 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 well, it is from the 50s, isn't it? 60s. 60s, rather, yeah. From 65, so what's that? That's 35 plus 22. Uh, 57 years ago. Yeah, well, so, so I was only young. Yeah, I definitely don't remember one of these. My dad never had one of these. No, I don't remember that, no. <laughs> the 1922 19th. Sunbeam Tourer. 1640 Sunbeam Tourer. A Riley Kestrel Sprite. It's funny, you, you look at the cars that you remember, don't you? Hmm. A yeah, Sunbeam. Before our time, those two. Yeah, Sunbeam Grand Prix. 1924. So one of the most famous racing cars from the early years of motor, motor, motorsport. Yeah, it won the 1924 Spanish Grand Prix. Yeah. It's all engine, wasn't it? Straight out exhaust. Now here's a car everyone's familiar with, isn't it? Mondeo. Mondeo, yeah. It's one of the first two cars, that the, one of the two cars that made the first ever attempt in the winter of 1993 to 94 to drive eastward overland all the way from London to New York. Two litre, four wheel drive, traction control and anti-lock brakes. Four wheel drive. Yeah. yeah. It took Car a team. Of the year. Took a team of eight, and the two cars more than twenty-five thousand kilometres across two continents. The route went through Europe, Asia, Siberia, by Bering Straits, Alaska, Canada, USA. Taken in, undertaken in winter when the Bering Straits is frozen, but in 1994 the weather was uncooperative. Ice was too thin, and the team had to complete the foot crossing on foot and by air. Uh, Mondeo's took over and they finished in New York. That was Car some of adventure. The year. Car of the year in 1994. Right, some old magazines here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Huh. You probably read some of these. <laughs> yeah. Lovely quote from Jeremy Clarkson here. Uh, you buy a car to do a job to move you, your family, and your luggage as efficiently as and cheaply as possible from A to B. You buy a fridge to do a job to, to keep your milk from becoming cheese. So how come there are 133 car magazines out there and not one that I know of anyway about fridges or microwave ovens or tumble dryers? This is because the car is more than simply a tool. It's a mobile status signal an art of a work of art, an adrenaline adjuster, and an integral part of the fabric of society. If your house is the warp, your car is the weft. Very good, Jeremy. Right, Jenny's going back to the car to check on Poppy. Don't like to leave her for too long, and I'm going down to the, what's it called? The, oh. Going down to the land, sea, and sky galleries, including the Museum of Innovation. Okay, see what's in there. 
Museum of Innovation. Bicycle tyres for ejection seats. Pentridge was known as the father of emergency medicine, dedicated his life to overhauling pre-hospital care systems to develop mobile treatment systems for heart problems and invented the world's first portable defibrillator, something that improves survivability today. So this is the DeLorean. Got a chassis here. And the prototype chassis there. Engine at the back. And the DeLorean DMC 12 first car it was meant to be a radical stylish break from everything that had gone before with unpainted stainless steel body, gold wing doors. I think up there is the Reproduction mold. So a short 360 cabin and cockpit. Locally built short 360 set itself apart from comparable aircraft and it's classified being able to use shorter runways. Comfortably operating using 4,500 feet railways, runways. The plane operated a cheap and reliable mode of transport designed to appeal to 1980s commuters. Travelling regionally, it's still in service as a passenger aircraft in a few countries at the beginning of the 21st century. Now its primary function is transporting cargo. What we've got here is the ejection seat of the Martin Baker Aircraft Company. Crucial for aviation safety. Advances and aircraft permitted ever increase in speeds that was no longer possible for pilots to bail out. Martin Baker discovered the most effective means of ejection requires installation of explosive charge beneath the pilot's seat. First life saved by a Martin Bale injection seat was that of test pilot John Lancaster in 1949. So this is a vertical takeoff and landing shorts. SC1. Silver plane is a prototype constructed at the Belfast factory in the 1950s, critical for research into vertical takeoff and landings. One of only two prototypes that were built. It was reconstructed in 1963 after a crash which killed the pilot. Four powerful engines beneath the SC1 were based on a Rolls Royce test rig, affectionately known as a flying bedstead. Agriculture should have been the first industry to be modernised and not the last. Ferguson Brown Type A machine employed a hydraulic linkage, an integral part of the Ferguson system, so plows could be lifted clear of the ground. Chuckling of a plough to a tractor showed that the vehicle was more nimble, more economical, also cleverly engineered to have a drill depth that could be adjusted rather than fixed. It would be revolutionary and set a standard for modern tractors. Massive Ferguson 25. <laughs> 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 Difficult way then. Realise there's some steps there.
I enjoyed this museum, it was good, it was well worth a visit. Lots of things, different things to see here on all different types of transport. It's different from your normal museum, I think particularly with the, the trams and the rail cars and those sort of things that are in the museum up there. Quite like the uh, Innovation Museum and uh, that's quite interesting. So anyway, if you enjoyed the video, give us a thumbs up and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing, it really does help us and we'll catch up with you in the next one. That's good. Yeah, building right up the top there. Yeah. I don't know whether we'll see it on here.